Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Hired Geek Podcast, episode number 186 with Chris Marshall. Uh, really grateful for uh, Chris to come on. Uh, he has his own podcast and does amazing work supporting alumni engagement all across the country. Uh, I met him uh, when he's working with my alma mater, University of Delaware. So really felt like he had an amazing perspective and awesome experience to uh, to share out. So uh, definitely connect with him. Check out his podcast, Alumless, uh, and his uh, company, Chris Marshall, Advancement Consulting, CMAC, uh, if you want to keep the conversation going or uh, work with him. But uh, super grateful for his time. And for folks who have been uh, listening or if you're new to the show, uh, please do take a moment to leave a five-star review if you enjoy the show. It really helps us out. But without further ado, this is episode number 186 with Chris Marshall. I'm excited for our conversation today to explore an area that uh, I've gotten a lot more interested in lately as uh, I've become a member at large of the board of directors for the University of Delaware Alumni Association. Uh, so that's been a really meaningful experience for me to have, but it's just kind of exposed me for the first time, really, uh, even you know working in higher ed all these years to the, the wider world of alumni engagement. So we're exploring that a little bit today uh, with our guests, but we'll start out as we always do, have them uh, quickly introduce themselves and give a overview of their professional background. Because I know, Chris, uh, you have a very interesting background. I think that kind of led you into uh, this work of kind of coming in and out and everything. So excited to explore that with you. All in. It's been 35 years for me in higher education. I've spent the first 13 of it um, in athletics and in, in NCAA Division I athletics at Lehigh University. I was the head men's and women's swimming coach for 12 of those years, an assistant for that first year. And then at the ripe old age of 23, I took over the head coaching reins including coaching guys that I was um, living with the year before. It was actually quite <laughs> unusual circumstance, but uh, it was supposed to be a one-year interim appointment that led to 12 years of one of the best jobs I've ever had in my life. But uh, head coach of men's women's swimming was a, a lot of fun, especially at my own alma mater where I had just been on the swim team. So that was, that was great. I loved the work. Um, I was at a point at the end of that 12th year where I could feel myself in the beginning of the burnout phase where I just, you know, it was time for something new in my career. So I had laid out a three-year plan to transition out of coaching into more athletic administration. The plan was to move into, you know, towards athletic director type role. And the, the gentleman who'd been my AD for that whole time, who's still the AD to this day, 35 years later, um, at Lehigh, Joe Starrett, a mentor of mine, um, he had laid out a plan. And then out of nowhere, the, um, the search committee at Lehigh University, who was looking for an executive director for their alumni association, they had failed the search. Uh, were desperate and they came over to me and say, hey, look, you're a guy who knows the place, has passion for the institution. Um, we, we think we can teach you all you need to know about alumni engagement. So why don't you come and take this? I mean, it wasn't that <laughs> of a welcoming offer. It was, hey, would you be interested in looking at this role? So I went through a whole process of interviews and rounds and rounds of it. And finally, a few months later, was asked to take on the role. And I went from you know, sitting in the swimming coach's office, coaching swimmers and the president at Lehigh at the time was Greg Farrington. He said, we plucked them out of the pool, we dried them off, and we plopped them over in the alumni office and said, go, gave him all the support he needed. That's literally how I started my alumni career. I was 400 yards across campus from where I used to work. I was now showing up to work in the suit and tie and delivering you know, a whole different you know, kind of um, value to my alma mater. It was interesting. And I reported to the president in that structure. It's a pretty unusual reporting structure. So I I did that for seven years at Lehigh. The, Greg, the president at the time, had left. Uh, they transitioned to a new president. I got the kind of hint that it was time for me to look elsewhere for the next thing. But seven years running the alumni program. So you're on the mater, University of Delaware, you're on the board. Laura, Lauren Simeon is the alumni leader, which is the role I had at Lehigh for seven years. Uh, phenomenal experience. I, I started you know, the first several years of it not knowing what I was doing and learned it as I went. And by the end of the third year, I found myself, I went to every single conference I could possibly go to to learn about this field, went to colleges and universities all around the country, stole the ideas and brought them back to Lehigh. Uh, and then by the end of the third year, I was found myself being asked to speak at conferences because they liked what we had built. And people were, sh were starting to see that some of the things we were doing were innovative and new to the industry. So um, jumped in uh, doing some conference work. And four years later, I built a reputation and Cornell University came knocking at that point when the transition and the president happened at Lehigh and Cornell, frankly, was looking for somebody who didn't know the institution, somebody who was a pro in the industry who would come in and and really wake up a sleepy alumni program that was you know, had phenomenal loyalty in the following and a base of alums who were rapidly loyal to the institution, but 
had a, had an old model of an alumni engagement program that needed to be modernized. So they brought me in to do just that. I did that for five years at Cornell. Um, and then I left Cornell to take on a consulting role with a large company. I did that for almost five years as well for a company called GG&A out of Chicago, a large 100-person firm. And they'd been around for 50 years doing fundraising, consulting, and they were launching several new practice areas. And they were launching one in alumni engagement. And they hired me to launch and run their alumni practice. There were three of us at the end when it was all said and done, but five uh, five years full time at it, and we had uh, over 150 clients, and it was just really fascinating to build a practice around alumni engagement consulting work that that partnered with and coupled alongside the fundraising consulting that was going on. So five years for a, for a large consultancy. Um, near the end of that, I figured out that I could do this on my own and um, didn't need to be doing it for a large company. Um, you know, the reputation was such that I could you know build, build my own client base. So I had a a little bit of a non-compete, so I actually worked for a company called Graduate, which is a tech company headquartered in London with a tech team in Israel, and they were selling uh, um, uh, really throughout Europe a very strong career mentoring, networking, and alumni engagement platforms set of services into the alumni market, which I came out of. So they wanted somebody who would expand their footprint in the in the U.S. and Canada. So they hired me as the president of Graduate North America. I did that for two years during my non-compete and. I had a good time learning a whole different industry, the tech startup companies stuff. It's just fascinating, that whole world. Um, so I lived in a different area for a couple of years, but still in the niche of alumni. And then four years ago, um, it'll be it'll be a four year anniversary next week where I launched my own company called CMAC, Chris Marshall Advancement Consulting, and added another almost 100 clients in those four years. And um, I'm over 250 clients now I've worked with. I like to say I looked under the hood of 250 alumni programs around the country. So I, I know what's going on out there in the industry. and um, a lot of good experience with so 20, it'll be 22 years now that I've been doing this kind of work, uh, coming up quick. So, um, I can't believe it's gone that fast, but 35 years all in higher ed and the last 22 of them in alumni engagement, probably longer than you wanted there, Dustin, but the, uh, that's, that's the crooked mile story. <laughs> It's all really important, I guess, to see that sort of whole through line journey. Cause yeah, I mean, like some people, when they give their answers to this, are like super brief. And I'm like, I want a little bit more. But like yours is such a like interesting story of sort of like even just how you were kind of like, yeah, like plucked up from the pool, like you said, you know, to sort of like tapped on the shoulder and, you know, kind of brought up, which I think is like really powerful, uh, you know, just for anybody to sort of be like, hey, I think you'd be good that, the, you know, they're sort of like, you know, kind of welcoming you in or sort of pointing you out and that sort of thing. Um, but obviously that, kind of really articulated or sort of uh, shaped your trajectory moving forward and that you even had those different kind of uh, perspectives or experiences like different institutions and then like at a tech company and at a big consultancy and now sort of, you know, obviously like literally your name is part of the title of the organization. Like it's very sort of like anchored around you, your, you know, vast experience and your perspective and your relationships and all of that. And I think like, obviously, because it's something that people are continually uh, sort of exploring or sort of examining right now is sort of those decision points around, okay, I've worked at a campus-based position. I might be considering something else, you know, may still be working in education, but like, what was that transition like for you going from a campus-based work to consulting, even though obviously, you know, it was still very similar kinds of or types of work, you know, still in sort of the same kind of ecosystem, but um, yeah, what was that transition like? The hard part about the transition like that is that, and, and it was even em you know, emphasized, uh, accentuated during the pandemic, is that you're on your own. I mean, you're you're literally working from home on your own and traveling a ton to do the work pre-pandemic and then doing Zoom Zoomathons every day, it felt like, afterwards. So you, you, you leave that, um, when I say team environment, I talk about the, you're part of a team and you're all working towards a goal together and you're there every day in the old pre-pandemic ways, is, is that part was what was the most striking difference for me is that you just all of a sudden that was gone and you were kind of left to your own devices to motivate and some people thrive in that environment some people can get by and other people struggle and say i just can't do it i i, I can't be a work from home on my own kind of person especially leading an old in, in the original case was my own division of a company and now my own company um it takes discipline there's a, there's a saying out there somebody told me this recently i never heard it working for yourself is easy you can work half days the hard part is figuring out which 12 hours you want to work. <laughs> and there's a lot of truth in that statement because I, I've worked more hours per week and per day since I've started my own <laughs> company than I was when I was working on my own or even before that when I was with a large university. So so the, the main thing, back to your question, the main thing I miss is that 
camaraderie, that team uh, you work you work in professionally speaking. But it also stems from the fact that I spent 12 years of a career literally building a team around swimming. Men's and women's swimming is what you the, the, the challenge in coaching a sport at a division one level where the academic rigor is strong at a Lehigh or a Delaware, wherever you look. Um, and uh, it's you, you, yes, you are a coach and you try to make kids go faster to win meets. That's the technical part of swimming. But the, that's that's 10 percent of the job of being a coach. It's managing the team. It's working with the kids that uh, are struggling academically with life and adjusting the college and life without parents. I mean, you're like a, an advisor, a mentor, and and then you're trying to set them all together on a path to build um, you know, uh, uh, the activity that we do to put towards a common goal to try to succeed. And our motto as a team was always let's let's have fun, work hard, swim fast, and the rest will take care of itself. So having a clear um, uh, North star to try to follow was something I was just sort of ingrained in the DNA for 12 years as a coach of a team. And I was on one before that. So when you translate that to a professional setting, the team nature of the work that we do in, in higher ed is, is one of the things that I still to this day miss the most. I don't get as much. And when I get a work with a Delaware or some several other clients now where um, I I'm brought in on a regular basis and I can feel like I'm part of that team. That's my favorite work where I can sit down at the table and be like an equal partner in what we're talking about or whatever the issues are of the day. That's the hardest part for, was the hardest part for me anyway, missing that team feeling. I, I think you get this a lot from people. Like, like if it's like, you know, they worked in the military or like in a sports team, like it's such a like tight knit sort of like community and team and affinity where it's like, even after all this time, you're still looking back and being like, yeah, like that was like, you know, even for people like if, you know, they don't even realize it. Like, hopefully they can, you know, work with a mentor or something where it's just like, like, well, where were the times when you felt sort of the most engaged or supported or able to grow? And it's like, you know, they might cite like, oh, when I was on the sports team and it's like, oh, well, maybe you want to work professionally, like as part of that, you know, like those sort of things. So just that you know that about yourself and that you, you know, just enjoy any opportunity to have that kind of experience. Cause I guess, yeah, like I can see where it's like, yeah, to even just like, like you said, like look under the hood of as many institutions as possible to kind of get that sort of landscape. It is tough if you just like come in once for like a workshop and just like talk about things and you're just like, all right, good luck. <laughs> like, and then le- it's like, I would prefer to like, you know, have a little bit yeah. of longer tail here, but I did that um, recently. A client recently you know, hired so, me to come in and yeah, give a training session, a yeah. one day training session. And I did the prep, I did the training. And at the end, the, someone on the staff said, well, what's next? Do we get to keep working with you? Get to keep using your brain? And I'm like, well, you got to talk to the boss because right now I'm leaving. And I'm not coming back. <laughs> it's over. And I don't like, I mean, I, certainly you get paid and all that's fine. But I, I just wish that there's that tail that you talked about. The longer the tail, the better the experience for everybody, I think. Let's play a game. What keywords does your website rank for? What doesn't it rank for that you think it should? What are a few opportunities you could be winning on if you tweaked some website copy? Okay, how'd you do? Not great? That's okay. Because our friends at DD Agency want to answer all of those questions for you and then some. DD Agency is a higher ed specific marketing technology agency that has conducted countless SEO audits for colleges and universities across the country. In these audits, they detail where you currently rank, what you could be ranking for, exactly how copy should be tweaked on website pages, and much more. If this sounds like something you could benefit from, give those folks a ping and be sure to mention that Enrollify sent you to claim a 10% discount on any of their SEO offerings. Head on over to enrollify.org slash D-D-A-S-E-O or simply follow the link in the show notes below that will guarantee you a 10% discount off of your audit. Again, head on over to enrollify.org slash D-D-A-S-E-O to learn more. Now, on to the show. Because, yeah, I mean, working in, in ed tech and thinking through, like, true, like, partnerships versus just, like, oh, you bought our thing. And, again, sort of just, like, good luck and whatever. It's, like, you want to have more, like, kind of tighter, uh, intertwined uh, partnership. But um, so, you know, speaking of that, that you, you know, work with institutions all over the country supporting their alumni engagement efforts, like, you know, sort of that 30,000 feet view, like, what are sort of the trends that you've been seeing recently in the space? Because again, like, I feel like I've just sort of like opened up a window into this like wider world. So like, I even just like talk about it with like people that I went to grad school with or undergrad, where it's just like, you know, 
like how how do you feel about that like does this like sort of resonate or whatever like how do you engage like so now it's just like been like in my brain so much of like you know talking with people so um yeah i guess sort of those broader trends nationwide for like alumni engagement that you're seeing um let, let me give you a little history first and then i'll give you the trend so um there are examples in the late 1800s of, of alumni gathering on behalf of their alma mater in class-based reunions. So you, you, you hear examples of Yale and Cornell and Penn doing the class of 1865, 10-year reunion, 1875. They're literally examples that back that far. And it was mostly volunteer-driven activity. By the early 1900s, there were professionals, and they were all called, so the, the leader alumni position at any institution was called the alumni secretary. And in 1913, 40 of them got together at the University of uh, Illinois, I think or Brian Champaign. It was it was the University of Illinois. And there was a 40 person conference where they got together and they shared, you know, best practices, what they were doing and how they were trying to engage alumni. It was called alumni relations or alumni affairs or typically the words that were used back then. But from 1913 I, I, to, to today, to 2023, you have 110 years of, a, of an industry that has been formed. By the way, in, in, in they also the organization that is our sort of trade organization for the work of advancement, which includes alumni engagement, fundraising, communications are all in there. The trade organization is called CASE, C-A-S-E, the Council for the Advancement Supportive Education. CASE points back to that meeting in 1913 as their founding, technically. So in 2013, they, they celebrated the 100th anniversary of CASE. So we're at... Um, 110 years now, but I always say this from 1913 to 2003, we pretty much had the same exact alumni program that existed everywhere in the world. (laughs) And certainly in the United States, which was, you know, I always use this class year and zip code. When did you graduate and where do you live? So we're going to do a class reunion for you at your 25th and 10th and whatever, uh, or your 50th is often the big one. Uh, and we're going to come to your location, your city, and, and do an event and bring the president or bring a faculty member and talk at your regional chapter or, or, or a club, they often called them. Uh, and, and, and it was the institution that was driving that. The institution owned the database. The institution sent out the mailings and did all that work. But in 2003, a little thing called Facebook came along and changed everything. I mean, it changed the whole game because we were suddenly disintermediated as an industry. And for the last 20 years, you, you've seen so... From 1913 to 2003, sort of see flat innovation in alumni engagement. There's a couple of examples of things that went on. It's unfair to say there was nothing, but it was pretty much static for 90 years. And then for 20 years, zoom. So trends have been very relatively recent. Most of it have been during the time I started in 01. So I came in at the beginning of when the change started to happen. Um, and trends today, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a couple. One, the biggest one is that for the 100 plus years of an industry, we didn't have a standard measurement for how we tracked alumni engagement. There were no industry-wide standards. There were for fundraising. So many of you, many people listening will know that there's a U.S. News and World Report as a ranking system. And one of the categories of that ranking system is alumni satisfaction. And that data point is a two-year rolling average of the undergraduate alumni who have made a gift to the institution, period. Nothing else. It's only measuring on financial support of alma mater. Uh, not dollars, but percentage. What percent of your alumni are making gifts is what they rank that category in in U.S. News. So that's one example. But we had not, alumni engagement had nothing. But in 2017, 18, I was on the committee that actually helped create the industry-wide standards where we're measuring philanthropy still in there. The one that they've always done is in there. So that's one. The other three we've added are experiential. So who's going to your uh, events? Who's joining your podcast? Who's doing things that... Um, you know, we, we can count as an experiential level of engagement. There's volunteers. Let's track all of our volunteers who serve on our boards and, you know, work in our regions and our class years and do all those things to help us do what we do. Um, and then there's communication. So, and, and by the definition, there's strict definitions for all of these. The communication one is loosely, you know, meaningful two-way communication. So you're not going to just count somebody as engaged because you sent them an email, but we will count them as engaged if they clicked on a story and, you know, we can attribute that to that individual record. So there are now industry-wide standards for measuring our work and that's four years old and that's still to this day you know four years in most institutions are not participating in that process so one of my roles as a consultant has been go around and say hey you got to give me you got to step up and participate in this and submit your data so metrics is number one and i'll tell the other ones a little more quickly but you know engaging your current students and your most recent graduates i call this early engagement some people think of it as like the minus four or plus five or plus 10, meaning 
the four years you're in school and graduation is the zero point in the first five years out or the next five years after that, those that minus four and plus five are the most critical points of engaging alumni. I call it planting the seeds while they're there and beginning the harvest or, or, or you know, tilling the soil, if you will, uh, going forward so that you, you can continue to have them connected to the institution forever, but you have to do things early on for that to work. So that's student and young alumni early engagement. Increasingly, we're seeing more uh, demand for what's in it for me from our alumni. So not just how can I help the institution, but how can the institution help me? So we see a lot of career professional development programming coming, leveraging the network, uh, job postings, mentoring roles for students and all that. So the whole development of professional uh, career support has come forward in the last 20 years uh, pretty significantly. Um, two more, um, affinity-based programming. So remember I said class year and zip code, you know, reunions and chapters. Uh, now it's, I was on the marching band. I was in a Greek letter organization. I lived in this on-campus house with this group of people or whatever. There's all kinds of ways people connect back to alma mater and providing them um, access to that part of the network and uh, connections back to alma mater through that particular affinity group we call it or special interest group is the term they use is another trend we're seeing more and more institutions do and scaling that over uh, a, a classic traditional reunion class or re regional model is hard because you're now building other you have staff and you have resources spent on having other forms of engagement that are not class or zip code related and a big one there is a hybrid of the last two things I mentioned. It's, you know, affinity around your career. I work in entrepreneurship. I work in tech. I work in finance. I work in energy. Fill in the blank, right? Uh, alums, that cuts across class year, cuts across zip code. But alums want to gather around that area. So we're seeing more investment there as a trend. And then the final one, I'll say a little bit of inside baseball. But what we're seeing more of in, in, in years past, it was not uncommon to have separate alumni associations that were legally and financially independent from the institution. And back in the 90s, you'd find several hundred of them who didn't need the institution to support in any way. Uh, um, and, and then over here was the advancement operations. So you had your friend raisers, if you will. I hate this expression, but people used it. You know, the alumni team over here, often the alumni association, and then the advancement fundraiser development people over here. And over the years, these last 20 years have been increasingly merging together. So most models now, your alma mater, Delaware, my alma mater at Lehigh, and you know, I can give you hundreds of other examples, they're in an integrated advancement model where the alumni position, the Lauren Simeone role at Delaware reports into the advancement structure headed by, headed by a VP for advancement, Jim Dicker. Uh, that's the normal structure. So 1990s, you had hundreds of, of examples where there were, that was not the case. They were separate. And in today, I can give you maybe a dozen examples of where that's still true. Now, many of them like Delaware are still legally separate. But financially, it's an interdependent model, in some cases, dependent model, where the institution is providing the full support to run an alumni engagement program as part of an advancement operation. The schools that are out there that are still independent financially are places like um, UNC Chapel Hill, University of Michigan, Cal Berkeley, um, LSU, Texas A&M, or five I can mention off the top of my head. But the vast majority of them, Delaware, and then the biggest uh, I can mention is Penn State. Penn State is an integrated model. They're, they're alumni association leader who has a very large separate 501c3 with dues-based program at Penn State reports into the advancement structure and a large portion of his budget to run his alumni program comes from the, the institution, uh, the advancement operation. So that's the norm where we're headed. And that's all changed in the 20 years I've been in the business. That's been the biggest trend that I've seen. I appreciate it too. Like you keep mentioning like Lauren and stuff where it's just like, like for me to sort of like, okay, let me put all like the pieces in because like, uh, you know, other people don't know who she is. She's a great person. I love working with her, but like for my own edification, I, I appreciate the, uh, the context there. Um, and yeah, cause I, I'm trying to help you, but <laughs> not, I appreciate you saying that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's like, I get the only model that I'm familiar with and I, I know that, you know, others do it differently. Uh, so it's, yeah, interesting to know that that's kind of the the trend line, and then yeah, obviously just the way that communication and outreach and technology is just really continuing and has been reshaping uh, the way that you know these institutions build community amongst their alumni. So um, just to kind of like quickly follow up on that because I think like you know with all those trend lines, I'm, I'm sure there's sort of friction points and roadblocks and kind of difficulties. Like what are you seeing as some of the sort of common roadblocks? Cause I mean, I even know just like, you know, even for undergraduate students today, like leveraging Facebook, which some people might be like, Oh yeah, you know, that's what we've done for a long time now. 
just is not going to have the same effect in this because like not as many people are on it as more or engaging as much or those sort of things. So like, what do you see as some of those roadblocks um, for engagement right now? In one word, I'd say it's competition and it, I can give different uh, flavors of that competition. One, just for people's time and attention these days is harder than ever. Everyone who's listening knows that you have many competing interests that are trying to get bandwidth from you and your time and attention. Um, but also competition from, you know, um, social media uh, channels that come along and go for us. Facebook stayed around for a long time, of course, but if you try to do a Facebook strategy with your current or most recent grads or current students, you're not going to get them, right? You're, they're not going to be there. Maybe. Okay? Some will. There's exceptions. But it's a strategy for a certain segment of your population that we need to be doing. So getting their time and attention, I think, is the biggest one, to be honest with you. I always say it's, it's making the list. So all of us have a list of things they care about and spend time. Mine are, you know, I, I follow Lehigh Athletics. Uh, I follow United States Swimming. Um, I have interest in a couple of television shows. I'm a big Ted Lasso fan right now. So those are things I spend time thinking about. They've all made my list. Some of them have been on it forever. Some are relatively new, Ted Lasso. Um, and if you can't get your alma mater on the list while you're a student to understand, I mean, if the alumni office can't get you to have it on your list by the time you leave and keep it there over the course of your, we're eventually not going to have them. They're, they're going to be gone. They're going to they're going to have more of a transactional experience with the institution. I came, I got my degree, I got a job, and off I'm gone. Versus a transformational experience where they realize that the, the, the journey they were on that got them that degree, that got them that job, had everything to do with the people that came before them that helped pay for it and made the connection to get them that job. And they should then turn around and say, I'm going to provide the same thing. I'm going to help recruit students. I'm going to help hire interns. I'm going to whatever, and, and even make a gift at some point to financially support on the market. It's not all about that, but it's part of what we look at and part of how we measure our success. So competing against everything else that's out there, let alone when you get into your life, right? You're now into a stage of life where I am. I have kids playing different activities, involved in different organizations. They have a, they go to a school where their school wants me to give them money. So now you have all these charitable <laughs> comp competition lists that goes on and whether or not Lehigh for me, Delaware for you, or whoever else listening, your alma mater hasn't made your list. And every single person listening to this right now uh, went to a school that in some way, the alumni that went before you provided funding for you to go there. You may not know it, you may not believe it, but I can tell you, if you dissected the budgets down and looked at it, part of the operating budget to run an institution is it's not 100% tuition that runs institutions, put it that way. There's endowment, there's, there's, there's giving from alumni, there's lots of things that come in play that make it a little less expensive for you to go no matter where you went. It's always cost a lot of money, but private schools, especially, but there are some uh, um, alumni that are behind that work. That's helping you helping fund that education that you had. So getting people to realize that is, is part of the challenge that we face as alumni professionals and getting on the list, I always say is the critical first step. Yeah. And I think even just like in my recent memory where like, as I graduated, there was sort of, you know, some, uh, effort to kind of ingratiate you to uh, the alumni association and knowing that like, you know, if I'd gone to school, maybe like a few years earlier, that wasn't happening uh, is also kind of fascinating. But like, yeah, like you said, like, it's going to be very hard to make that list if you don't do the sort of like you said, like, negative four and plus five, you know, like those sort of like early times when you the seed uh, planting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah, I mean, like planting the seed, because I mean, like, that's such a like an appropriate metaphor, I think, where like, it takes time for that to grow and be sort of something that you can harvest. But I think there is sometimes such a like, clamoring or like almost like you're just overly eager to uh try to like reap some benefit from you know folks as they graduate and that's you know when yeah like you turn them off and like even for me i'm like you know i guess yeah it's like i, I can understand why again yeah they, they're trying to help you know offset some budget costs or whatever with like donations and stuff where it's like you know trying to find other ways maybe to like you know if everybody chips in a little bit you know that can have sort of bigger impacts versus sort of like hounding people for like, you know, larger money uh, donations or like that's again, like the only touch point is usually like the, the frustrating point where like all I'm hearing from them is just asking for money, whatever, because I think, <laughs> and I want money. sort of like, <laughs> yeah, like if like sort of your perspective on this, cause like, as I've sort of gotten acclimated and understand, you know, sort of that visceral feeling uh, that a lot of people have with their uh, institutions, like, do you feel like eventually, like, like you said, you sort of just lose them, like, you kind of have this like sort of calcified disengagement sometimes with like alumni bases of certain institutions because like they've just been turned off so much and it would take like a really like hard effort to kind of chip away at that kind of like just hard shell. You got it. I mean, you hit it. I mean, 
think think about a place like um, so Delaware is a little different in this regard. But let's let's I won't name an institution, but you everyone listening probably can think of an institution that is a very much of a commuter institution where there weren't residence halls. People can't. There's a lot of community colleges fit in this category, but even some four year schools where people came, they drove to campus, they got out of their car, parked got out of their car, went to a class, got back in their car, drove to work, worked all whatever hours, and went back home, studied, and got their home, and went back did it again the next day. They, that's a transactional experience, and schools like that have a very difficult time engaging because they're, they're going to see that as not on the I list. That was just a, me purchasing a product, in this, in this case, an education that's going to allow me to get the next job that I want, and I, I don't have a connection to it and an affinity for it so that I'm not going to add it to my list. I'm not going to go back to the events. I'm not going to make a gift. I'm not going to volunteer because so at any institution, you know, if you could get half your alumni, you're doing amazing, right? And there's some smaller liberal arts schools that can get, you know, up to the two thirds or three quarter range. But at any institution, I would say 25 percent of the alums fall in the category that you just described. We're never going to get them, no matter what we do. So, so let's 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 target the ones that we have a chance for that that, that you know have interest that have shown things and demonstrated um, some level of engagement that we can then leverage in other ways. But um, it's hard it, it, when you get to that category. It's 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 almost impossible to break in. And and it, the worst thing we can do as an industry is if somebody in that category right has developed a technology or launched a company that got sold and they made hundreds of millions. You know those big exits that people have from startups. If we go to them at that point and say, hey, we just heard you sold your company for $100 million. You want to be on our board of trustees or we that's too late. We waited too long. So that's part of the tension that we feel, too, is how to keep them engaged when they fall in that category for such a long period of time. Yeah, well, I think just generally, you know, the work of education is sort of complex and dynamic and, you know, engaging in that way. So it's a welcome challenge, I guess, of trying to, you know, figure that out. But to try to get a circle around and sort of a positive note and try to put a kind of a, you know, cherry on top or sort of bold underline highlight this point, like, you know, if for some reason you had to sort of like give the elevator pitch, you know, of why effective alumni engagement is so crucial to kind of like the future of institutions, uh, you know, certainly, like you said, you know, they're, they're getting the money, you know, to help with their budgets or they're, you know, uh, getting these alumni to, you know, help hire grads or give internships and mentorship but like if you kind of had to summarize sort of the you know the the urgency the necessity the the importance and you know of all this work for an institution how would you capture that i, I think there are I'll, I'll capture it succinctly and i'll tell you a story it's going to be a little longer but it's worth hearing um the four areas that i think alumni engagement can play a role in in advancing an institution Alumni should, should and could play a role around recruiting new students, uh, retention of existing students, hiring our graduates and in internships and full-time jobs, and fundraising. And three of those four are direct revenue sources for the institution. The only one that's not is hiring our graduates. Now, that, I would argue, is a longer-term benefit because when institutions do well and the graduates do well and they have jobs and move on, then things can happen back. But the other three... You know, getting someone to come. So I had, I had a client, a public university, flag, not a flagship, it was a regional public institution, not the flagship of their state. A chancellor say to me that for every kid that says yes to us and doesn't go somewhere else, it's like a $10,000 gift from an alum because that's the average tuition that that student would pay to go to school there. So recruitment of getting more kids to say yes to us and no somewhere else versus us. Retention, getting someone to move from first year to sophomore, junior, senior year and graduate. Is another ten thousand dollar gift each time they say yes and stay in it enrolled at the university. So mentorship roles and getting alums involved and helping students in that path through college. Of course, the hiring and um, internships and jobs is, is a direct one as well. But the, the other one is fundraising. Yeah, all three of those four are direct impact on revenue bottom line. And for an institution, for them to take alumni engagement seriously and think about those three potential outcomes that I just mentioned that are revenue lines. They have to put it for forefront in their strategy. And I looked at a strategic plan for an institution yesterday. This is a pretty elite private institution. They have six pillars for their overall institutional plan of what they want to accomplish. And the word alumni was not mentioned in it once, not a single time. But I should take that back. It was mentioned one time around major gift uh, fundraising, using alumni as a source for major gift fundraising. The other five pillars that were mentioned it didn't come up at all. And I wrote back and said, here's how you can include alumni in all five of these things. Or in fact, I, made, I did all six. 
of how you involve alumni in life institution to help. And I added the things I just talked about. They should be involved in recruitment, retention, and other you know, hiring and all that. Reputational ambassadors for the institution. There's plenty of places, but the institution has to take it to a point where they consider it a priority. And here's the summation of it all. So the four words I mentioned before, I will summarize again, are uh, recruitment, retention, hiring, and, and fundraising. That's where alums can, alumni engagement plays a role and impacts an institution. The, the other thing I'll share is this, is when, when a president chancellor stands up in front of their audiences and says, the blank community, the university of blank community, our faculty, staff, and students, and then stops, they've missed out on the, only, the, the most, the only permanent and the largest constituency when they mention their community. They should add the word alumni to their talking point. When they say our community, faculty, staff, students, throw in parents, but alumni should be in there too. Because alumni are critical. And if they don't say it, they don't act it, and don't believe it, and it doesn't show up in your strategic plan, it's clear it's not a priority problem. That's where I see it. So I think we need to get more places thinking about alumni in the equation when they talk and describe what a community includes for any institution. Mm. Yeah, that's powerful stuff. I mean, I really love those four pillars that you shared. I think it's such a great, succinct summary of why this work is important. And, you know, if you can get these uh, alumni to provide these opportunities, uh, you know, to help recruit students and help giving them meaningful experience while they're studying before they graduate, I think, you know, that sort of will uh, sort of have a reciprocal effect where those, you know, students as they graduate and become alumni themselves likely will uh want to kind of pay that forward and everything. So uh, really just love everything, your perspective and experience, uh, super valuable. Um, and as we wind down, we always like to give the opportunity to share any resources uh, on this topic. Uh, so feel free to kind of, uh, yeah, just list up anything that you'd want uh, that we can include in the show notes. Yeah, in terms of places to, to look for, I mean, I always go back to the, uh, the trade organization for us as the number one thing, CASE, the Council for the Advancement and Support of Education. C-A-S-E, it's case.org website. CASE is the trade organization that covers anybody involved in fundraising, alumni engagement, marketing communications, and then there's a whole other, there's a fourth category on, on information technology and data services. We call it advancement services. So that uh, those four industry, um, are all, uh, industries are all part of advancement. So the Council for the Advancement Sport of Education is where you'll find tons of resources. I mean, it's just unbelievable what they have. And it's been around forever and there's data and you can you name anything and they have something to do with it. And it's really where I got started doing my own research when I wanted to learn the industry better. So case.org would be the number one. And the number two one, I'll plug my own podcast, um, the alumni engagement podcast that I do every other Friday. We do a live session on LinkedIn for a half hour. Then we record a separate bonus section for a half hour. And then we put the, them both together and publish that as a podcast called Alumless. A L U M dash L E S S. And we completely stole the uh, name of the show, uh, Smart List. If anybody listens to that podcast, it's a great one. And we, we decided to call ours Alumnus. We, la we launched it a year ago. We've done uh, about 24 sessions. Uh, every other Friday, we bring in a guest and we talk about topics in alumni engagement. Uh, it's often industry leaders, industry um, people are facing some of the same challenges that uh, the rest of their colleagues are. And we bring them in, we interview them on a specific topic. and. We have a great lively chat. It's myself. It's my colleague who works for, for CMAC called, um, uh, his, his name is Ryan Catherwood. Um, he's our tech and producer and expert of all technology things. And he and I get together and bring in this third person as a guest to talk about industry trends. So I encourage you all to tune in, find it on Apple Podcasts, anywhere else you can download your podcast. Alumless is the name of it. Perfect. Yeah, I love that uh, uh, kind of call out to make sure that we kind of all have a common basis of understanding with data and sharing, collaborating, kind of bringing that network approach uh, uh, that we can all reach higher levels of success together uh, with, you know, working with uh, and through kind of case organization there. So we will end, though, as we always do uh, with our final question, uh, final thoughts or call to action that we can uh, leave everyone uh, with to uh, wrap up the episode. If for anyone listening, all of you, many of you have gone to college, university and have an alma mater. And so for anyone, my encouragement to you, my call to action would be is get involved somehow getting back. It's somebody else before you made it possible for you to be there. And and I believe that we owe that back. And whether that's a financial contribution or giving some of your time and mentoring a student or hiring an intern for your company, whatever it might look like, but give some of your time back. Uh, give some of your um, time, talent, and treasure, as they say in our industry. 
uh, and, and that will help alma mater. It'll help you. It'll make you feel good, but it also, and who knows, you might benefit from it too. What, what we're seeing now in our industry is more institutions are offering value to their alums for engaging. So I always believe that there, there could be something in it for you in the, in the end, of, end of it as well. So, so for anybody, reach back alma mater and engage. They would love it. And then for anyone on the call who happens to be an advancement professional uh, or works in the alumni engagement space listening to this, um, I would my call to action and plea to you would be what I shared earlier. I say to every client, if you're not participating in the case alumni engagement metrics, please do so. Submit your data. You can benchmark yourself over others. You can benchmark yourself over time. And you'll be helping the industry by providing quantitative data that will help us in our journey around metrics. I would argue that the case metrics is the crawl in the evolutionary stage of crawl, walk, run, fly. So we have a long way to go. But if we don't have data in our system, in our in industry-wide tracking that we do on this, we're never going to be able to get to the point where we can correlate, even have causational and even predictive modeling that will help us do our jobs better. So please add your data into the case AEM, as it's called. Thank you so much for that, Chris, and for taking time out of a busy day uh, to chat uh, for this episode, You know, sharing your whole story and uh, all the different kind of perspectives and experiences that you've gotten over the years. Of you know, Dustin, thank you so much for letting me join you on your show today and, and letting share my thoughts with your listeners. And I wish you the best, and I appreciate being part of what you're doing. Good luck to you. Hey, all Zach here from Enrollify. If you like this podcast, chances are you'll like other Enrollify shows too. Our podcast network is growing by the month and we've got a plethora of marketing, admissions, and higher ed technology shows that are jam-packed with stories, ideas, and frameworks that are all designed to empower you to become a better higher ed professional. Our shows feature a selection of the industry's best as your hosts. Learn from Mickey Baines, Jeremy Tears, Jamie Hunt, Corinne Myers, Jamie Gleason, and many, many more. You can learn more about the Enrollify Podcast Network at podcasts.enrollify.org. Our shows help higher ed marketers and admissions professionals find their next big idea. Find yours at podcasts.enrollify.org.